My good buddy, Mr. Abudian, my sidekick in this venture, and, and he's really the catalyst. He's the one that came up with this idea, believe me. And uh, my good buddy from 50 years to the AYF, we were counselors here together. He was a counselor. He was the uh, bottom, the camp director here, and uh, uh, just put together a wonderful program uh, for you all to enjoy. Mr. Thank you. This camp is very unique. There's no question about that. Extremely unique. Uh, just the fact that we have three generations here uh, and it continues to go uh, the way it was built. And in fact, you'd have to say that it's quite improbable that we have this camp. Who would have thought that you could build this camp the way it was built and 63 years later, it is still going and it's going greater and greater. Any, any part of our history, our recent history, has to go back to the genocide. And that's really where this camp came from. The, the first, from 1915 on, the idea was for our parents, your parents, to survive, and then to create families, and to re recreate families, actually, and to recreate community. And that's what they did. So in those first 15, 18 years after the genocide, that's what was going on. In 1933, the AYF, the Armenian Youth Federation, was created. It was created, actually there were a couple of years when they tried to create a youth organization, but weren't successful, and then General Nozier, Karakin Nozier, came to the United States, he energized and galvanized the youth and made it happen. And that's why Gadigin Nozhev's statue is in the middle, because if it weren't for him, the AYF would not have been created. But it was created, immediately after it was created, the AYF in 1933 committed to a camp. They said it was important for the youth to have a camp. Why was it important for the youth to have a camp? Because we had strange names and we lived on the streets. We had a name like Mesrop or Mugadish or Osana, right? We had strange names. And we looked a little different. We had funny noses and we were a little darker than everybody. And then when someone said, what are you? And you said, you're Armenian. They said, say, what's that, right? And we were very, very defensive about ourselves. And the concept of having a camp where our young people could come together, realize that there are a lot of other young people just like them, and that we have a lot of reasons to be happy with the fact that we have an IAN at the end of our names, was the purpose behind the creation of the camp. But camping is not part of our means, right? It's not part of our psyche. Who's going to send your children? I mean, these people, you know, we've had our, our parents and and were separated from their parents through the genocide. You're going to send your kids now to a camp, you know, far away? You know, who's going to take care of them, etc.? It was not in our psyche. The concept of camping was certainly not in our psyche. And here in 1939, by the way, when we're committing to a camp, we have 25% unemployment in this country. 25% unemployment. And we are part of a worldwide depression the greatest depression in the history of the world. Well, from 1933 to 1940, the central executive looked after and looked and looked to try to find the right place. They, they traveled all over, people traveled all over. Some, some areas were actually, people were willing to donate properties and all, but they didn't find the right mix of location, okay, and topography, and everything else that was needed. But that happened in 1940. Now, what's happening in 1940, which makes this all the more improbable? There's a global war going on. Europe has already been captured, essentially, is under German hands. In the Far East, uh, Africa, Northern Africa is already in German hands. Uh, Asia, the Japanese have invaded and conquered uh, Korea and are, have invaded China. Okay, And it's clear that War is coming here. War is coming to us. War is in the winds. We're going to be involved in war. Okay? We still have 15% unemployment, and the reason why it's only 15% is because people are now working in industry and in defense industries. 
people are working in the government CCC camps, so we still have tremendous unemployment. And under these conditions, on July 28th, a group of a couple of people visited Franklin, one of which is Harry Sarchaklian, a very key person in the history of this plant. And the, the location was actually recommended by a gentleman from Franklin by the name of Mr. Apalakian, Senekedim Apalakian. So those are two key names in the history of this camp. And Harry Sarchaklian was very, very impressed with the site of the camp and what was here and what he could see, what he could have a vision of. So he recommended, and within 16 days, within 16 days, a decision was made and the land was born. It was ours. All I can think of is, what were we thinking? Or as my mother would say, you know, literally. I mean, when you think about the time period in which this all was coming to be, it's unbelievable. And of course, the most unbelievable part is yet to come. So, now our men have gone off to war. Many of our ladies are working in defense industries or taking on roles that the men had during that time. And 1946, the men returned from war. It's time to restart their lives. It's time for all of you to restart your lives. Okay, you put your life on, on hold for four years. Okay, what happens? Now, the central executive says, hey, you may want to put your life on, on hold, but we want you to devote your weekends and some of your vacations to building this place. Now, if you thought it was a unique or improbable, I would suggest that it was impossible under those circumstances to do what happened. We had articles in the weekly. We started raising some funds, some chapters through uh, dances with the money's going there. Some uh, some people there were donating. There's one person there, 50 cents. There's a dollar. There's five dollars, etc. But it all adds up, and it begins. The interesting part begins. The part where you all come in. That's Sarkis Kocha. Yes, Worcester. This is a Worcester game uh, going going to the camp. Uh, Mr. Sar Mr. Kocha's son sent this picture to us 10 years ago. Uh, and so they had to clear the land. They had to clear the land. They were, they were with axes, and occasionally someone might rent the chainsaw. This camp was built by hand. I have more power equipment in my little workshop than all of you all did in building this place. And I don't have a big workshop. You, have, you cut a log down, what do you, how, how are you going to move it? They had to get three guys and roll it. Okay? And they worked winter, summer, men, women, they did it. I mean, that parking lot didn't get cleared by itself. It didn't have a construction company come and knock it all down. These guys did it. In the winter time they came, and here they are moving a log by putting it on a sled and pulling it. Okay? Gets cold, trying to stay warm a little, bring back memories. Uh, the gentleman on the right is Ken Kazanjan. Here he is working here, right? He was a prisoner of war during World War II. And here he is back, putting his life on hold again, working here. The good news is it starts to get cleared up. Well, we can see finally some construction. There's our, there's our hey, why have truck. You can see now that when the uh, administration building is there and they're clearing the area, which would probably now be the basketball court. Uh, Red Bedrosian from Worcester, I believe. Red had lost a leg in a farming accident, right? But, and uh, he used to come down quite often with some of his equipment and, and cut the athletic field grasses. This, I believe, I believe, Miss uh, Rose Barjan, I believe you're in that picture, and on the left. And then there you also have the uh, Bedirian sisters from Franklin. That the, the people from Franklin not only supplied you know, physical labor, but they were wonderful in supplying food for the, for the whole gang. And here they are cooking. This is another picture of some cooking being done. 
Uh, here they're having lunch. These are the platforms that, that Barbara spoke of, uh, someone mentioned, uh, someone mentioned that being delivered, that became the cabins. The guys are resting. And here's just some pictures of some of the guys and gals. Who, who's the gentleman on the left? I don't know that name. I'm trying to, anyone know? Uh, the, that, the gentleman in the middle, lower middle, is Sonny Gabor. Okay. Hal Abadisi. Hal Abadisi. Hal Abadisi. If there's anyone, if there's anyone who's, who built this camp, who had the vision and the foresight to make it happen, it's how I would these. Hal is in that picture also, and I believe that's Peter Eknoy. Okay, and and there are two there are two photographs here in this in this room. In this room, there are two photographs. One is Hal over there on my left, and there's a photo of Peter Eknoy all the way on the right in the back. Those are the only two pictures that are here. Uh, I think we have here Sean Chibucci and a young Astor Gazette. Or maybe an unwise Astor Gazette, right? <laughs> and here the uh, couple ladies are drinking from the well, which still exists today. Now you can see the recreation uh, facility, the uh, building right behind us. Uh, starting to shape up. A couple of ladies shingling the roof of the administration building. Uh, you teens, you uh, you ready to give up your weekends and come here and do that kind of stuff, huh? These guys did it, you know, these guys did it. Here's the dining hall. This building, uh, this building was about from here to there. All of this is a, all of this is a new addition. Uh, but it's coming to fruition. The administration building. And now the center of the circle starts to take sh shape. And finally, 1951, it becomes a reality. In order for anything to be a reality for Armenians, you have to have a priest, right? <laughs> so there was a large gathering at the very entrance um, as you drove in, the very entrance. And there, Nushan Papaja from Providence led the group. And here's the con here's a group walking forward with their Nushan. Now they're on the steps right outside, talking to the folks. And and here are amongst the very first the, the, the very first boy campers. The boy on the right here, Saul Children, was the first registered camper. However, there's another young boy who's not in that picture right now, Armin Boyajin from Brooklyn, who claims to be the first camper because he got here on Saturday and slept overnight before the camp officially opened. We will let them to duke it out. Sal is in California. Armin Boyajin was a member of this committee and lives in New York. So, 1951, the impossible was shown to be what? Awesome. Absolutely. And that's what this group did. My young friends in the team session and the staff, this is the group that did the impossible. This is our first boys session. There were, there were two sessions, one for boys and one for girls. The first one, 12 youngsters. 12 youngsters. Okay. Robert Avakian, Bob Avakian is the second person from the right the back. Bob, Bob ended up holding every single position that you could hold here, from camper, to counselor, to director, to executive director. So the early years, what were the early years like here at Camp Pius? We just had a handful of campers, okay? The, our facility was just the lower campgrounds here. Okay? Uh, very limited facilities, very limited. 
separate boys and girls session. In fact, the sad thing is that we don't even have a picture of the first girl session. I believe there were seven girls in the first girl session, 12 boys in the first boy session. So there were 19 youngsters that came in 1951. Swimming was in the pond, and Roger John Cadence last week was talking about all the leeches in the pond as he would work in there. And it was mainly an East Coast venture, right? I mean, practically everybody came from New England in those first early years, maybe a few came from New York, but really it was essentially an East Coast, Coast venue because people didn't have cars, transportation wasn't that easy, the big highway was Route 1, Route 1. But let's go to today. We looked in the rearview mirror a lot, let's look forward. We have hundreds of campers. Last year we had about 375 campers. We have the entire campus from the time you enter 722 Summer Street up there to get here. The entire campus belongs to Camp Pius on the summer camp. We have expanded facilities. And we'll show you a picture of some of them and you'll have an opportunity if you'd like to, to take a tour of the place. We have eight specific sessions now. Instead of separating boys and girls, we have a day camp for really youngsters. We have a teen session for the teens who really need, want and need a different program than everyone else. And then we have a regular session for all the ages in between. Uh, we have a relatively new swimming pool, maybe 10 years old, which you'll have an opportunity to see. Our campers come from everywhere. Everywhere. Maybe 30 states, including Hawaii. Egypt, England, Italy, France, Canada, Brazil, Bermuda, Belgium, United Arab Republic, uh, Kuwait, and Armenia. Can you believe, would you believe that your efforts here resulted in someone from Armenia coming to Camp Hyas? But, but this group of founders did more because they, not, they, didn't build, they did more than just build Camp Ayastan and also did more than provide the spirit and the culture that's continued. Today there are six Armenian camps throughout the United States. I suggest to you that not one of them would have been come into play if Camp Ayastan had not been built and had not succeeded. So indeed, what you've done is given a gift not only to the people who come to Camp Piastan, but you've given a gift to all the people, all the youngsters that go to all those other camps too. Today, probably in the order of 50,000 children have gone to Armenian camps because of you. Because of you. And, that, and you have true ownership of that. Just some pictures here that, that Garo Lachinyan took this, this Monday, two days ago, by the way, Garo Lachinyan, father-in-law, a uh, founder, Junai Haraturi, okay? Garo Lachinyan's wife uh, was here as a camper. Garo Lachinyan's daughter, uh, Talin, was here as a camper and also a um, staff member. And today, where is Talin? She's working as an intern, as an intern at the ANC, Armenian National Committee, okay? So, and as a matter of fact, if we think about that, Mr. Hamparian, who heads up the ANC, was a past camper, past counselor. And we have people throughout the entire country who have maintained the Armenian identity because it all got strengthened, galvanized, and made firm right here. So you can all take great, great pleasure in that. The cabin circle, the, the dock area. This is uh, the administration building, the, the pavilion. By uh, the way, the pavilion was built through the auspices, mainly the auspices of Michael Bakhtiarian's family. When they had a loss in the, in the family, their, his sister had loved this place. 
and so the family donated a large amount of money to the building of the pavilion. The basketball court was recently redone, the whole, that whole area through the, Gelati, the contributions from the Gelatian family in New York. The swimming pool, these new bunks that are in addition to the cabins that you built. There's Baron Hago with the director's quarters. Now, actually, this, this photo was taken immediately after the hockey game, I understand. <laughs> you saw the picture of the 12 campers? This is a few years ago. This is not the largest session. Okay, this is not the largest session. And the beautiful thing about this picture, and a couple more I'm going to show you, and the pictures that I showed you of you all, are the smiles. This is the day camp, okay? Day camp was run for a total of two weeks, one week session. I happen to love this one because my tour league is in that picture. This is just a staff, just a staff. We have about 40, 42, 43 uh, folks on our staff, okay? So, let me ask you, is the camp that you built and the camp that we have now are they the same or are they different? What do you say? By the way, Sarah and is it Ted? They gave us our first workman's comp cases for this year. She complained to me that the calluses that she had from working here some 60 years ago are still there. And Ted showed me the scar that he had, which uh, I couldn't see, but he swears is there. <laughs> Is the camp the same or different? Facilities are quite different, quite different. But then again, the facilities of yesterday could not meet the demands of today. Our times are very, very different, and our campers are very, very different. So indeed, those two are different, but the culture is the same. And I think that that's what makes Camp Piaston, truly unique. The culture, and that culture was established by our founders. That culture was established by our founders and it runs through our staff and because most of you as campers have been here several years, it runs through you too. These three are key roles. Bobby Abakin, who was, again, started as a camper, counselor, executive director for about 25 years and indeed led a lot of the the concepts of expanding this place. Roy Callan who then took the, the baton and was with us for 10 years and now that baton has been handed over to Baron David and it's going to be his role to take it on from here on in. Okay? But it's all going to be done through your help because he already has the spirit and the understanding and the culture having been here as a camper and as a Bonwan, and he has, uh, I think, one or two of his children here, so that's already in his DNA. But we have all kinds of volunteers. We saw pictures of you all volunteering. My favorite picture, besides the black and whites, is this one. That's a real picture. That's a real picture. She, this young gal actually was working here at a work session, okay? And she was working here with her parents, but she was, that spirit has all come from you. So, 63 years, we have an unbroken chain. I want to show you a chain. This chain, the longer piece, from there to here, how many links do you think we have? 63 links. Okay, 63 links. And it's up to the, to the board and the staff every year to work to make this link, the one that we're in, stronger and stronger. Okay, you can't get to 64 without going to 63. Thank you, Michael. And it's done one year at a time. Mount Meridian's very words, 
the role of these all is to make it better and better. Make it better and better. Yeah, we did this, but you guys are going to be able to do it better. And you have to do it better because our campers are going to want it. Okay? And, and the role is to keep passing it on. But that golden one is the one that this group is responsible for. Now, you may notice that I had more links than 63. There are a hundred links here. A hundred links. And in the year 2050, there'll be a hundredth anniversary celebration of this camp. I'm not going to be here. Okay? But there's no reason why our campers and our staff are not here. Absolutely no reason. Okay? But they're going to have to make it happen. And that's their role. Okay? Now, how, how do we thank you? How do we thank you? Thank you is not enough. William Saroyan, he said, send them into the desert without bread or water, burn their homes and churches, then see if they will not laugh, sing, and pray again. For when two of them meet anywhere in the world, see if they will not create a new Armenia. Camp Hayastan, since 1951, is the only place in the world, the only place in the world where the tricolor has flown every day, where Medhanik has been sung every day, and the high Med has been said every day. The only place in the world. created a new army. That's what you did. In Saroyan's words and in the reality of you created a new army. Uh, ten years ago, the board saw fit to honor your group. And they, they, placed, they placed a stone on the key walkway, the very first walkway, and I'm going to read it, ten years ago. Three generations of campers thank, thank the founders for their foresight and unselfish effort in building this cherished treasure known as Camp Hyostan. This, this, my dear founders, this is your legacy. And I hope that you're proud of it. And I hope you make sure that every one of your children and grandchildren and friends and everyone else realizes what you did. That's your legacy. Now, I said I don't know how to thank you, and thanking, the thank you word is not proper, but there is an Armenian saying. When one does a good deed to help others, and a deed that goes without being compensated, there's an, a saying that literally translated says, God will compensate you. And that saying is, Vatskit Gadam. And that's what we have to say to our dear friend and founders. Lots of good time done. You, you've accomplished your mission, you, your commitment that you took on, and you passed it along. Now let's, let's think about our founders. Okay? Abraham Lincoln, in delivering his Gettysburg Address, said, Pe people will little note nor long remember what we say here. But we'll always remember what was done here. And they would suggest that the Camp Hayastan community, the Armenian community, will very quickly forget what we say here. Okay? But we'll always remember what you did. You will always be remembered for what you did. Okay? Uh, a author and newscaster wrote a book about uh, the American generation that went off to war and then came back and just unassumably went out and did their business and did very well and helped build this country. Four generations of Armenians have come through this camp. Four, including you all. And we suggest campers, staff, we suggest that what you're seeing here is Camp Hayastan's 
greatest generation. 